Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondap webinar in association with Denmire, where we will be discussing the new AI era in the patent industry. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by a truly excellent panel to take us through today's discussion. Christoph Van Ziel is an esteemed attorney possessing over 15 years of expertise, which has endowed him with a profound understanding of all intellectual property matters. Throughout his career, he has adeptly represented clients in prosecution and litigation. Christopher Bruckner is known by many IP experts in the pharmaceutical industry as the author of the German-English Commentary on Supplementary Protection Certificates. His combined qualifications as patent attorney and pharmacist, in combination with his corporate in-house experience, makes him a sought-after contact for legal and entrepreneurial issues. Santiago Rivas founded and leads as Global Head of Analytics, the Client Intelligent Unit, a data science powerhouse of the Denmire Group. Santiago is an expert in machine learning, AI and neural networks. With a focus on predictive analytics and process automation, Santiago uses his in-depth knowledge and experience to develop innovative solutions that drive business success. Now, before I hand over to the panel, a housekeeping item, you are able to submit questions to our panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page and we'll endeavour to answer as many of those questions as possible. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Christoph Santiago and Christopher to begin. Thank you. So can you all see my screen right now? We can't Welcome see it at the moment Santiago, my apologies. Just try that one more time. Can you see it now, Dan? We can't see it now. What we will do is um, take back control and we'll give it over to you again, Santiago. No problem. Dan, can you see my screen now? Yes, I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can. I can see your slides now, Santiago. Perfect. So, welcome to the Nemeyer Tech Time, a series of talks where we will delve into the fascinating of world of technology and its profound impact in the intellectual property sector. Join us as we uncover the challenges and the opportunities of the latest technological advancements in the IP industry. Today, we stand in a pivotal moment in history. The new transform models have taken the world by surprise and would change forever how we work. I can comfortably say that we are not just standing at a new dawn. We are accelerating towards an AI revolution that will forever redefine how we, our understanding of innovation and intellectual property. And what better way to start than with one of the greatest inventors of all time, Leonardo da Vinci. He was a painter, sculptor, architect, engineer, inventor, uh, inventor, anatomist, musician. He did all. He was without a doubt one of the greatest minds in history. His contributions to art, science and human understanding continues to amaze us to this day. But would you be surprised if I tell you that the image that you see actually in the center of your screen is not done by him. It's not done by a human at all. And this is what is fascinating about AI. It can mimic the abilities of the greatest people that have walked the earth. And this is what we're going to talk today, how the new Transformers models have managed to mimic one of the abilities that until today was reserved exclusively for humans. The ability to communicate, the ability to reason. And this is what we are going to talk today. But before we jump in, we're going to jump into a quick poll to actually understand how many of you have actually used ChatGPT and how it has impacted your life. So please join me in menti.com to actually give a quick vote to understand how many of you have actually interacted with the machine before. So if you go to, there's two ways to go to Menti. You can either scan the QR code that you actually see right now in screen, or you can go to menti.com to the code 79178517 to actually log in. 
And with this, I'll start shouting a little bit the results, so I can see quite a bit of you have already interacted with the tool. With the tool, so it's not surprising. It's quite of a famous tool by now, but it's uh, it's right now it's 22 to five, 23 to six. Quite of an impress impressive. You can see that three times more people have interacted with the tool than they actually have not. And if I go to actually the next question on how it has improved your day-to-day -day job. Of the people who have used it, how it has improved your, your life, how it, are you using it during the day-to-day -day job? I know it's a more difficult question because it's more of a conceptual one. So but people have not used and have not been affected at all. Quick results, not yet. Helping drafting, speed. Not that much. Well, so starting. So there's quite a bit of now here convoluted uh, feeling. So some people have used it a lot and some people have, have uh, not seen that much impact their day-to-day -day job. We're hoping that by the end of this talk, we will be able to convince you that this is actually a quite useful tool that you can use. And this is what we're going to try to tell today. We'll start with a quick review of right now the past. What is the difference between the terms of AI, machine learning, deep learning, transformers? What do they mean? And then actually going to actually chat GPT, the part, how it has surpassed everyone's expectation and how is everybody using it? Then we will unravel of how the mysteries of the, mo the model work. How, it has, how we can delve into their inner workings and explore the limitless possibilities that it brings. We will actually later go to the cherry on top, practical use cases, how experienced attorneys have used it and use it in the day to day. And last, we hope that by the end of this webinar, we will inspire you, inform you, and equip you to, way, to harness the power of this, um, of this unparalleled tool, hoping that you find this interesting and that you find it useful. And with this, we start a little bit with the beginning, a little bit of history, AI, what, where does come AI come from? And AI is not actually a quite a new to, uh, concept. It actually is a quite old concept. It dates back to the 1950s when John McCarthy, along with their, his colleagues, Marvin Minsky, Nathaniel Rochester, and Claude Shannon, actually proposed a conference in the Dartmouth College, artificial intelligence. They defined it. They actually started developing models. They defined the AI as the possibility and the capacity of the science, the engineering of making intelligent machines. However, the first models were quite simple. They were rule based. They were simple. Uh, if you do, if I give this, you do this, and then you do this. Similar to how your scheduler works in your calendar. You actually propose, you ask for it to find the best lot, and based on some preconditions, some, some constraints, it actually finds the best position to allocate a meeting. However, it was not long. The 60s started rolling up, and actually new models started developing, machine learning models. These models had the capacity not only to follow rules, but actually to detect patterns, to learn through a process called training, to actually self-taught, so actually based on the, the uh, repeating process over and over and over again, trying to find the optimal path. One of the best examples of this was the, the model that Samuel, Arthur Samuel proposed, how it learned, it taught a machine how to play checkers, and it would play, it, the machine would play against itself over and over again until it found and it, it became a really strong checker player. But this is, we did not stay there. The, the algorithms start keep developing, but not only algorithms. There were quite some developments in computer science, in hardware, in data centers, and we started developing more strong models. But also, we started understanding more the human mind, understanding how our neuron works, how our brain works, and how how the connections between neuron works. And we started developing the concept of deep learning. I'm sure that we, if I tell you the word of neural network, you already probably have heard it. We are all scared about this word, thinking like it's really complex, but if you think it conceptually, it's not that complicated. If I make you think about the picture of a duck, we all know what a duck is. You can see their beak, you can see their head, you can see the feathers, the wings, the body. If I ask you to think of that image in black and white, you can still th see that it's a duck. If I can ask you to think it as a drawing, you can still see that it's a duck. And this is what your brain is doing. It's adding layers. It's thinking that there's a circle, there's a triangle, that looks like a duck. It is similar what you do to, to a machine. You start teaching it about angles. That's the first layer. You teach it about shapes. That's the second layer. You stick it, start teaching it more complex layers, animal kingdom, 
specific uh, concepts like feathers and each layer would add another dimension to this part and each layer you connect through different nodes and these nodes it actually these neurons that you actually develop you weight them and it actually gives you the most appropriate outcome so if you put it in an image of a duck it would actually be able to predict what is the most probable outcome which is that it's a duck and this is the concept of, of deep learning transformer takes this concept and gives it an extra extra twist based on text logic and applying a new concept that concept of self-attention based on the 2017 paper attention is all you need it actually allows self-attention and understanding what's the concept the relationship between words and based on that it tries to predict what is the most probable or most expected outcome and with this it surprised anyone's expectation just to give you a little bit of numbers ChatGPT so started recently. Well, we started with early with earlier model GPT, but the latest model GPT 3.5 started in November. In the first five days, it managed to get one million users. To give you a concept of how, what of a feat this is, it took Facebook nearly a year to get to this level. The most com the most impressive one, which was Instagram, took nearly three months to get to one million users. But it did not did not stop there. Within two months, it had managed to get 57 million users, and we're now in the third month it has surpassed at 100 million users and it's doing 1 billion searches per month as of february 1 billion searches think about this every second of every minute of every hour there's 23,000 searches being done if you as a human would try to do one search per second it would take you 32 years to actually be able to reach 1 billion searches and the model is able to handle this instantly without any problem and this is one of the feats that this model does. And now you might ask, well, what is this magic? How do they do it? Well, this is done with the following, what, to see what's under the hood with this following logic. Just bear with me while we deep dive in what's the difference between how the model takes the inputs, breaks down the values, keys, queries. No, not, let's not do that. You don't need to know the technical, technical details. The importance is the concept. And the concept that there's an encoder and there's a decoder. Let's make it really simple. The encoder takes the input, they convert it to vectors, to actually virtual representations of the world, capturing the contextual information. And the decoder gets this information and tries to generate the response, predicting the words one at a time of what is the most probable next word. Both of them use leverage on top of algorithms, the concept like self-attention mechanism to efficiently process and generate text. And this is what it does. But maybe let's not put it in a, that conception. Let's give it an example, a really easy example. Let's say that you ask the model, what is a patent? Well, the model, what it does is it vectorizes first the word. What do you mean by vectorize it? It actually does not only define what word it is, it defines several categories. Those, those categories could be, for example, patent is in the realm of inventions, it's in the realm of intellectual property. It gives it up to 250 dimensions per word, allowing it to actually know the relationship between words, knowing if one related one word is a noun, if it, that's noun and it's in sector of IP, it's related to another one. And this, it actually combines the whole sentence. It actually, with a really, really imaginative and fancy trick that they, the uh, mathematical trick that they do with positional encoding, it allows to actually see the relationship between the words. And it actually, this is what it does. It creates this vector, it inputs it in the model, and the model tries to predict the next word. And the next work after that, it takes that word, it puts it back into the model and tries to predict the next word and the next word. And this is visually what it does. If I input the model, what is a patent? The model it just tries to predict one word and one word, one word after until it reaches the inevitably end token, the full stop. And it knows that that's, by that point, it doesn't need to continue. This is fascinating. This is a revolution. However, as any revolution, it doesn't come without caveats. And it has quite some minor limitations, although we need to actually discuss them. The first one is the hallucination problem. No, I don't mean that you have to take the machine to an, an asylum. It actually uh, means that if you actually give it an, a prompt, a specific, let's say that you ask it about a particular patent, let's say that you ask about the European patent 2049-363, it would all full confidently tell you this is a system and that the title of this patent systems and methods for interactive programming guides with personal video recorded features. 
and it's based on a United States uh, based company, Rovi Guides, without a shred of a doubt. But if you look at it, it has nothing to do with that patent at all. It actually is an actively ventilated vehicle seat. So it's completely different. But much like your in laws, if he does not know something, he might just try to predict what you're expecting to hear. So this is one of the problems that the models try now to be uh, the, the developers in, in OpenAI is trying to tackle. That when it has not, it doesn't have exactly the context, as it's just trying to predict one word at a time, it sometimes invents the concept. Then another oop, another issue that we have is that it actually lacks sources that are, are up to date. I give you an example. If you ask right now the model what are the US fees for renewal for a, renew, a patent renewal, it will give you old fees. And the prices have changed significantly since then. The last two issues, although what, uh, are there more tackled for they're being improved right now with the latest model of GPT-4, they're still being a major concern. The model is not able to understand some part of the context. An example of this, if you ask the model, there's two mothers, each mother gives a, a birth to one child, and the, a nurse comes in and the two fathers come in. The model does not understand birth and that each mother gave birth to a, one different kid. And if you're asking how many people are in the room, he might tell you it's just six. So this is the concept that the context is something that the machine right now cannot capture. As well, it refuses to do estimations. A really example of this, you a simple one that you can illustrate this example. If you ask the, the GPT right now, such GPT, that it predicts how many Netflix users are in, in Luxembourg. It, can, it cannot tell you. And this is quite a simple calculation. You know the penetration rate of Netflix in Europe. You know the population of, of Luxembourg. You do the simple multiplication. New models are trying to tackle, and they are now getting closer to uh, fine-tuning this part. However, even with the new models, let's say you take another more complex example. You ask it to predict how many active patents are in the world. The model refuses to tell you how many active patents are in the world. You press it, you tell it, okay, are they around 10 million? It says, oh, sounds about right. And then you tell them, okay, there's a renewal every year, predicting how many renewals there are, or how many patent renewals occur every year. And the model still refuses. It's not a tool meant to do estimations right now. For that, there are other models. But however, not only looking to the caveats, looking at actually how it will change the intellectual property sector. And as all you know, as you all know, the intellectual property sector is quite a vast one, going from patents to trademarks to copyrights, utility models, industrial designs, and trade secrets. This is something that I can self and assure you it will transform and change every single part of these sectors. It will not only change the way we work with it, but also will change the legislation in all of them. But today, however, we will look only into patents and actually how it will affect our day to day jobs in the value chain. In particular, my colleagues will focus on the part of the drafting and then also in the part of office, office actions and others. And this is where our both Christopher Van Seel and Christopher Brooker will actually look into trade technology agreements, how you can actually help use the model to develop and to actually help you in your in, in creating trade agreements that are actually efficient and fast and really uh, exact. Later on, how it can help you in your day-to-day -day parallel requests how you can leverage for basic in-house documents, and last but not least, the most one of the most interesting aspects, how you can use it to draft the patent. And with this, I pass to Christophe Van Sil, one of the leading experts in this area, so he can show you an active example. Thank you very much, Santiago. It's so nice to listen to what you have to say about how chat GPT functions, because the first point that I would like to make today is it is very difficult to understand how to use this technology unless one can understand how does it work. And what I learned from you uh, when we had our discussions before this webinar that I used when we did our own test cases at Denimeyer was to have a look at the limitations of this software because those limitations place it in the exact context in which it's useful for us. I would like to hear from the audience a lot about your experiences because I see many of you already tested ChatGPT and a lot of the responses that we saw on the screen were, well, it helps with drafting, don't use it at all. Perhaps it helps with efficiency. So I see a lot of people have done similar tests and it would be really nice to exchange views on this. But my view is that 
one still has to be a subject matter expert if one is going to gain any efficiency from this tool. So if I asked it to draft something about brain surgery or any other field, how to fix a motor vehicle, the document might look good to me, but to a mechanic, it would be completely off tone. And this is because the tool is off context. Um, many people will tell you that, well, as we, we know, a good lawyer doesn't know all the laws, but where to find them. And ChatGPT doesn't tell us the source of its information. So from this point of view, it would only be as good as the person providing its instructions and the results would only be as good as the clarity of those instructions. So the better the instruction, the more directions it receives, the more information that the tool has, the more useful it can be. That said, I still think it saves a lot of time and it won't replace attorneys for now. It won't replace in-house legal counsel, but it will certainly change the way that we work. Perhaps in three months from now, we will see this tool in Microsoft 365 as co-pilot. This is what is reported currently. And at that point, we will no longer be typing into this chatbot, but we might have these tools on our desktop to create documents, Excel files, Word, etc. And the best example that I can think about is just looking how we used to work five or 10 years ago, or even 15 years ago, when I was a trainee attorney and this is still the case now in many in-house departments and law firms, whenever we received a instruction from, an instruction from a client that was slightly non-specific, uh, so not the standard filing, not the standard prosecution, not the everyday IP stuff that we knew how to do, but really more complex agreements like drafting a non-disclosure for a technology transfer agreements, then I would go to the library, I would have to spend three to four days researching this topic. The more knowledgeable attorneys, if they want to draft an agreement like that, would dictate it or maybe type it. And the tool is definitely a writing assistant. I can remember when a client walked into our offices and the client was a water management company who had developed a method to extract minerals from flooded mines. I'm from South Africa and in Johannesburg, for those of you who have been there, it is a mining town and there are several mines, some of them kilometers deep. And what happens over time, of course, these mine shafts flood and not only do the mine shafts flood, but the groundwater in the immediate vicinity of these mines becomes uh, contaminated by some of the minerals. And of course, this, uh, these minerals cannot be easily extracted well, they can, but the commercial challenge is it's very costly. Mines operate with a very low margin. And uh, at the time, people were saying it costs six or seven times uh, the amount to reduce, to remove uh, minerals from the mine drainage water than to mine directly. So obviously, this wasn't profitable. And the water company, they had come up with a method, according to them, which was not novel. It wasn't patentable, but it was a better way to extract uh, minerals from flooded mines. And one of the large mining houses wanted to buy this technology. So we had a week to draft this agreement. I marched off to the library. I took about four or five days. I drafted a non-disclosure agreement where the, the buyer of the technology could have an idea of whether or not the technology would be useful. And after that, the due diligence could take place. And if the negotiation was successful, finally, the parties would sign a technology transfer agreement. So let's put it to the test. Let's see what happens if we tell chat GPT-4, the latest model to prepare, firstly, the non-disclosure agreement and then the technology transfer agreement. While we watch the answer, one of my first comments is, look how fast it types. So imagine if I was an attorney and I knew everything about non-disclosure agreements, which very few experts ha have this, this knowledge. Most IP counsel would spend a while researching this topic, but now in approximately 10 seconds, I have an agreement. And let's have a look what I asked it to do. So I gave it some very clear instructions. I told it, that my client is a water management company. 
I mentioned that we need to perform this due diligence to see whether or not the technology can be acquired. I mentioned that it is very important to commence the agreement with definitions of the parties, confidential information, trade secrets, and intellectual property, because this would be the essence of a non-disclosure agreement of this kind. You need to have a very clear definition and we need to see what sort of answer chat GPT can give us because it won't disclose its source, but can it propose a draft? My assessment of this draft is that it was a very good draft in a sense that it replaced the version that my paralegal or that I would have produced as a junior attorney. And it of course saved time. So in approximately one minute, we have a draft agreement. We have a fairly good definition of confidential information because it's quite a broad definition. We have the parameters defined very well in the definition of trade secrets, which is important. We have most of this information well defined, but it's slightly off tone. So it would need still some billable hours of work to make sure that these definitions are fit for the purpose because the context is not exactly appropriate in this circumstance in these circumstances but this is not bad it's better than what we would have obtained from a library uh, if we looked at a template it's probably as good if not better than what we would have obtained from a shared drive or anywhere where the information would have been stored and it's effectively done in a much shorter time what if what 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 would have been done over two to three days manually and through typing or dictation so here, the assessment from my perspective is we do not have a we do not have an expert, but we have a tool that gears the knowledge of the expert in order to be more efficient. What I like about it, of course, one can ask the AI to improve the draft. So my comment here, when I looked at this, was that we are missing an annexure which describes the technology. So how would the party on the other side know more about this uh, technology if it's not properly defined? So this would have to be done by the engineers in the water company. It would be outside the expertise of the lawyer, but the lawyer could help to draft it. Nevertheless, it should be mentioned in the agreement. So we can give a clearer instruction to the AI. We can say, please, will you attach as an annexure the non-disclosure uh, as an annexure to the non-disclosure agreement, a description of the technology. And here it makes proper reference to annexure A. As part of this agreement, annexure A provides a detailed description of the method and is attached here to and incorporated by reference. The receiving party agrees to hold annexure A in confidence, etc., etc. Not perfect, um, far from perfect. In fact, there's not enough detail um, in this clause, but what would have happened in 2006? The junior attorney would have taken this to the partner. The partner would have made changes in pen. The secretary would have typed it. We would have all gone home and the next day we would have discussed how to amend this clause. Uh, what would have happened in 2015 or 2019 or even before chat GPT-4? The digitally efficient attorney might have typed this on his computer, made several changes and not started with such an efficient draft. So this is really the, the application, in my opinion, not at a very advanced level, but more for the day-to-day -day drafting as a day-to-day -day assistant. Let's have a look at some different examples because I think this was a very specific example, but the question for many people who are in-house would be, well, how can it help me? And if we talk to in-house lawyers, uh, Every day I hear about the fact that costs are so necessary to manage in a cost center. Um, In-house lawyers want to do more. They have to do more. They don't want to use external counsel all the time, but they have limited resources. Using this example again, these engineers who are going to do the due diligence, um, maybe they need to sign an additional non-disclosure agreement to the employment contract. Maybe the in-house counsel needs to write to these engineers to ask them to sign the agreement, but would like to send a letter that's very well worded because these are valued employees and only has half an hour to come up with the right answer. The AI can do this, in my opinion, a lot better than 
the job that it did for the, the technology transfer agreement um, and the, the non-disclosure for that agreement. Because here we have a much more general agreement. Honestly, this would be very similar to a template that I would find on an online resource. But nevertheless, it still has learned from the instruction and the specific situation what needs to be mentioned. And on top, it has provided the cover letter, which is a fairly good working draft. I think for the purpose of an in-house exercise uh, that doesn't have external liability for the company, this is an example of where the tool would be extremely useful. And of course, now this is just the very start of the process. We will have to wait three months, six months to see how effective is this tool once it's once it's integrated into Microsoft Office. Many people say, well, yes, uh, this looks good, but what about the privacy and the legal issues? And these are very, very important issues. It's not an area of my expertise, but having talked to privacy experts and compliance experts, the gist of the situation is the staff, especially the attorneys and the paralegals need very good training on what they can and what they can't input into the AI. Of course, managing confidential information is often about the user, but it's slightly more complicated with the AI. So I could easily uh, fax my medical records to the pizza delivery company uh, using a telephone when telephones came out uh, almost a century ago people were worried about the authenticity of the caller. How do I know that the person calling is the person they say they are? So these debates about data privacy and legal issues have advanced significantly with the technology, but many of the core concepts remain the same. And the practical application of this is speak to your legal experts, speak to your compliance departments, but put together some very clear guidelines uh, for example, not to add personal information, not to add email addresses, not to add trademark numbers, uh, any identifiable information pertaining to the client, and to be very careful with the, the training projects when uh, rolling out the software, that some test cases are done, that people get to understand the parameters, that they get to understand the limitations, because one of the biggest risks here is not understanding the limitations. The AI would certainly not always provide an answer that's in the correct context. And what I've said now, I think, is very relevant for paralegals. Paralegals are the core of any legal operations. And every day, one of the biggest challenges is administration. For example, if a paralegal has to draft a power of attorney Let's use a real example. The other day, somebody was asking for a power of attorney to file a trademark in South Africa, but they wanted to limit this power of attorney to something very specific, the filing and prosecution of a trademark, but no other types of IP. And the particular client wanted a clause that managed um, corruption uh, as part of their global policy. So we tested this, and again, we had within a few minutes, a very good working draft. I would not say that a paralegal should send this power of attorney to a client, but in this case, the AI incorporated all of the relevant clauses. And interestingly, I see now in this live example, it did not include the anti-corruption clause. And in fact, the reason for that is because I didn't, I didn't add it. So let's add it and let's see what it does. You can see the speed that it prepares the document is much slower than my typing. I think the fastest typists would type 80 to 120 words. And even if we compare that speed, there's a major difference here. So here we have almost instantly an anti-corruption clause, and this would need some revision, but perhaps in 10 minutes, the client would have the power of attorney that it requires. These are very general examples that I've mentioned, but I think many of you will be wondering how does this 
to assist with complex patent applications. And this is something that is outside my area of expertise because I specialize in trademarks and general IP, whereas my colleague, Dr. Christopher Bruckner, is an expert in SPCs and patent drafting. And he has done some tests to see, can ChatGPT4 draft a patent and how good is it? I turn over to, to Christopher to demonstrate to you the capabilities in that respect. Christopher, you have your muted, I think. So, yes, now we can hear you. Okay, so, okay, thank you very much, Christopher, for uh, Christoph for your nice uh, explanations and uh, your um, story of the of the mind technology. Um, I want to continue now, and uh, I would like to ask the question whether the chat GPT will be able to fulfill the dreams of patent attorneys in a few months or so, um, that the system can draft a patent application. So in the real life, normally, it starts with the report of the invention. The inventor um, gives you some keywords or bullet points. If he's more professional, and then drafted in some sentences and uh, uh, from this in uh, cooperation with the inventor then you draft the claims the claims are the core of the of the patent application the the claims um, yeah identify the invention so but in the patent application the claims are combined with a description so and the description is very systematic so it would be uh, really a chance for Ch chat G gpt to draft the specification based on the claims normally um, uh, the the specification is based you have a technical field which is traditionally the first part of the independent claim one then a background technical background here you explain what is available at the moment in the prior art. And then you explain what are the disadvantages of the, of the technical situation at the moment. And starting from this disadvantage, you define the problem to be solved by your invention. And uh, the problem is solved by your invention. Um, that's the inventive solution. And then you explain uh, different embodiments of the invention. And uh, as we will see, um, the embodiments are, are taken traditionally from the dependent claims. So if the machine learns more in the uh, details of patent law, it would be great to, um, to develop a uh, description based on the claims. I will present you now a very simple example, five claims, and here uh, to draft a specification based on the five claims is not a big job. I just want to show you how it works, but imagine if you have an application for, let's say, with 50 claims or 100 claims, or a patent examiner at the German patent office told me he got a patent application with 10,000 claims, and all directed to gene sequences. So then it would be really great to have a machine uh, uh, which develops the specification based on the claims. So, and you see here in the presentation, uh, why do we need to apply for a patent? Just to give you an idea, the, the philosophic idea behind patents is the following. Inventors don't want to show their invention because then they are copied. So, uh, but the uh, politician said, if everybody works secretly in his or her home, then inventions are done. The same inventions are done in parallel. That's a waste of energy, intellectual power. It would be nice to motivate an inventor to show his invention so that the other can learn from him. And this would make the 
development of technology faster? And how can we motivate uh, the inventor to show his invention by giving him a kind of exclusivity by the patent up to 20 years? Um, here I show you the first page of a patent I selected for you. And it's a, it's a um, machine who develops structures from artificial materials like plastic under heat. Here you, here you see a, a roll and the material is brought into contact with the roll. And um, the idea of the invention is to, to combine it with a specific uh, yeah, um, place for tools. Let's have a look on the claims. Extrusion machine for the continuous production of profiles from the formable extruded material comprising. And now the claim um, adds the different features. One friction wheel is what I showed you, the wheel, um, a tool holding device, which is mounted on a pivot axis close to the friction wheel, a locking device. At least one tool unit is supported on the tool holding device and up to here. This is a, a sum up of the prior art. This is these are the, you can by the existing prior art, you can create such a machine. And here characterize the term characterize for the patent expert is the signal now comes the core of the invention. The feature which comes now is novel and inventive, hopefully, over the prior art. That is how a, how a claim is drafted. So, And then here you see the dependent claims. And the depend, dependent claim um, explains some possible improvements of the invention. So, And these dependent claims, in the in the specification are drafted as preferred embodiments so and le now let's do the following we copy the claims together with our friendly advice Please develop a patent description based on the following claims. So let's see what happens. So uh, the machine is well trained and well educated. Um, it begins with the technical field. The, um, the description describes the um, technical field, uh, what is the invention about, and uh, what I want to check with you now is that's a typical um, mistake of beginners when they are learn the patent law that they mention the inventive part, this part here, characterize in the technical field. Then, if this is part of technical field, then where is your invention? So, and let's check what uh, our program did. Um, that the tool divide is supported uh, of the holding device. So. Okay, um, see at the first, that's a detail, but um, there you see the difference between a machine and an expert. Um, the reference numbers should not be mentioned in the first part of the description. 
they should all be always mentioned in the uh, explanation of the figures, but not with, uh, apart from the figures. And what you see here is the, um, the program um, combined different claims. Yeah. What, uh, what a patent attorney wants is a clear um, separation that you see, for example, in a preferred, and you see what is really uh, astonishing in the program is when you try it three times on a day, how different the answer is. And I tried it in the morning and it really developed uh, preferred embodiments. And now uh, this version is worse than the version in the morning. Um, uh, what the program creates is not so bad, but uh, at the moment he has still a uh, lot of work to do to make it a real description. Uh, one is what, you, what I told you is um, um, the, the technical field is not really clearly separated from the invention and the different dependent claims are combined and not really uh, separated from each other. But uh, as I told you, in the morning, it was very nice. So, And that will be interesting in the next days or next weeks. How can the program learn? If I say, make for every claim one preferred embodiment or so, uh, that you just try to fine tune your uh, technology of asking the machine. So, um, okay, take home message. It's really a fascinating program and might offer a, a big help, support for the patent expert in the future. However, at the moment, what the program offers you cannot be filed with the patent office. There's a, a patent expert has to do many fine tuning to bring to shape, but anyway, you have the, the body of the description it's always better to have a, a text you can correct than to draft the text by yourself. Um, one, one question for the future is, will the machine be able to uh, adapt to the US style of drafting patterns and to the EP style of drafting patterns or to the Asian style of drafting patterns? And, the, and another one, and that would be really the jackpot, will be the machine in a few months or so be able to take from a figure. If you offer a figure and the machine could take from the figure, the features in terms and draft the claims. That would be genius, but I think there's until that time, the uh, JetGPT has to learn many things, but uh, you see we are on a good way and let's see what the future brings. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Christopher, Christoph, and Santiago. I'm blown away. That was um, so fascinating to hear you speak in such detail and such expertise on that. So thank you very much. Um, we have a bit of time now, 10 minutes or so, um, for some questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, as I say, such a fascinating topic, um, this is your opportunity to, to ask your questions to these esteemed panelists. Um, our first question comes from Matt Harrow. Um, could you discuss the confidentiality of chat GPT work, please? I, I can share a few words here in the terms of the confidentiality agreement. Well, as we kind of said, there's a quick, this, uh, big disclaimer here. Chat GPT uses your responses and your prompts to actually also train their models. So the, it is actually using it live and not running it in, in any way locally. This always brings a little bit of issues if you're working with confidential data, given that you will be disclosing things that you're not or legally entitled to do so. However, in order to solve these problems, there are now quite some solutions in the market that are being developed. Not only their, their solutions within the Microsoft and the ChatGPT uh, environment, where Microsoft is, is working on actually having them running locally in their Azure, in the same environment that you have, and it could be running in, in your own local servers. But there are even other models that even it may be not as powerful as ChatGPT that could help you the same. And that would even go as simple as running it in your simple machine. I mean, the latest ones that I could test around, which were based on the Lambda and the Alpaca models that were done by, by Stanford and actually for uh, by Google, there's some that really, really powerful that were running 
just with my computer, not even needing the powerful and the power of, of, a, of a server or, or the what ChatGPT is running. So this is kind of uh, where the industry will be heading. I don't think that we will be heading to one single centralized solution, but rather as the, the market evolves, we will have kind of a, we will democratize, democratize these, these kind of models and different companies will run them on, on their own servers and train them for their own data sets. I mean, this is something that already started with some several companies. So. Stay tuned because this, this is something that will definitely come. Brilliant. Thank you, Santiago. Um, this question from Sonia. Pasting draft claims on chat GPT might create a novelty issue. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, that's an interesting question uh, because the machine combines existing knowledge and uh, is looking what would be the most uh, suited uh, um, answer to your question. Um, uh, it's, for example, when I worked together with uh, inventors from China, they had a complete different um, approach. They asked, uh, uh, what do I have to do to become novel over the present prior art? And I think here, the machine might be able uh, in, a few, in a few weeks or so to, 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 to combine the, the existing um, prior art and then to find uh, what's a, what might be an approach to be inventive over it. Uh, in the European way where you draft the technical problem, it takes some months more for the program to develop novelty I will not exclude it. We had last year the discussion that a machine can be an inventor uh, has been applied by the German patent office. Um, yeah, let's see what the future brings. We are open. I can also add a few touches to that answer. Uh, yes, also take into account, yes, also related to the first answer that I, I gave. If you input something that's confidential and for whatever reason, if that prompt is used to actually create another novelty, you could also be risking the loss of novelty. So that's also one of the risks of using mm -hmm. an, uh, a model that is where you're not running it locally, but you're, uh, it's hosted externally, where you're probably not fully aware of what they would do with the data. And even if the data is anonymized and the uh, OpenAI invests quite a bit of effort to make sure that it is uh, it is not user specific that they're not to be trying to track you but they're just using the, it to train their models even in that those cases if the solution that you're you're asking a really particular question and the model picks up on the the prompt that you gave you could potentially be running into a risk of loss of novelty hmm. but just uh, maybe if you are in a situation where you have only a few days and it should be filed very soon yes. then it might be an approach <laughs> you simply take the docu documents of the inventor and formulate some claims, file a patent application, then you have the day, and then the next day you use uh, chat GPT. And you can take back your first application whenever you want. Great, excellent, thank you. Um, we've had a number of questions in regarding prior art. So I'll, I'll take Daniel's question. Has anyone explored whether chat GPT is useful in searching for prior art? And, and I guess if you have any thoughts around prior art as well that, that you would like to share. Uh, it, uh, go ahead. Yep. Santiago, go ahead. No, yeah. It's not the best to, to search. I mean, the, the models, as I said, you might be thinking that you have uh, a good example, but it might just be inventing. I mean, I had the, the example where, where a an, an lawyer was trying to draft uh, a kind of argument for, for it uh, to present. and he was uh, searching for something really specific. We just made up a little bit of a law from scratch. So you have to be really careful with the hallucination problem that the models have. And uh, it's for that search that uses, I would say that it might help you in some preliminary searches. So you could look into maybe what's the authors that are most uh, involved in certain areas or what the companies are more involved in certain areas, but it would not help you to search for the specific examples. Mm. 
That is uh, what I try to explain, especially my private inventors. Uh, the money you save at the beginning by uh, using a cheap search or drafting your claims by yourself, or so um, you have to spend uh, when it's granted uh, ten times more. Um, you, when you are in a uh, an opposition, you have to defend your patent in opposition, or you are in a litigation case. So, um, yeah, don't say, don't uh, save the money at the wrong place. Brilliant. We still have um, a bit of time for a few more questions. Um, Florian asks, can ChatGPT provide its sources if requested to do so? I've tried this, and in fact, it's very interesting because I wrote an article based on knowledge in my area of trademark practice and i asked it to add the references and it did but not all of those references were correct so it was the same situation as with the drafting you have to be the subject matter expert to know and to be able to check that reference and to change it to one that is suitable it gives internet addresses it gives sources but because it doesn't pinpoint the information it might tell you a broad collection of data from which it obtained that particular information, but it would still not be a credible footnote in many instances unless it has been checked by the human author, changed by the human author, validated by the human author. So we have to be very careful with this, yes. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you for that, Christoph. Um, I think to end, um, we have a question in from Cedric. Um, an interesting question. Are you concerned for your job? Will human intelligence still be needed for this type of work? My view is that there will always be a demand for legal expertise. People used to say that with uh, the switch to email, certain formal aspects of legal practice would disappear. In fact, I have an anecdote. Uh, when I was in primary school, the school called a speaker who was a futurist and the futurist was predicting what would happen because of technology. And he gave this example that all the post offices would close down because nobody would send a letter by post. We would all use uh, email or fax and there would be electronic methods to transfer messages. And in fact, the opposite happened. We have Amazon, we have all these companies that specialize in online shopping um, this was before the tech boom, about two years before. So I think the same thing will happen with legal practice. There will be more and more of a demand for expert work. At the same time, clients do not want to pay for administration that might become completely redundant. But at the same time, I don't think you would meet at the corner of every, any street a person who says, I was a typist in 1991 and I've been unemployed for 30 years. So it will gear the practices that we have, it will gear the work that we have. And I think commerce and the legal practice will simply become a lot faster. So instead of drafting five agreements a week, attorneys might draft 10 or 15. Maybe the pricing would change, but people would reach out more often to obtain those legal services. There would be completely new areas like AI and compliance. This is becoming more and more complicated if people like Elon Musk are saying, let's stop the development of this AI for six months so that we can consider legislation like the draft legislation that we now have in Europe concerning AI and automation. We can see that we are closing certain areas, but then other areas of practice are opening. Yeah, maybe to add just a few words, it's not that long ago when in the 80s or the 70s and 80s were and 90s were all computers and also the, with the advent of internet or the same comments were done of like, would we need lawyers now that we can automate searches in terms of, of prior cases or prior legals? Well, I, I think that nobody can make a case that there's less lawyers now than there was back then. Uh, the only thing is that the time that we spent in actually high value uh, actions would be much, we would have much more time to, to invest in those ones. So I think this, I mean, I'm quite of an optimist myself in, in how these models would affect the world. And uh, I think that the same that well, nobody can now complain that the industrial revolution has, in, I mean, undoubtedly helped all of our lives, lives in general. Well, but back then, if you go to UK, when uh, this first like machines were being rolled out, there were protests saying that 
I mean, they should, we should stop and that they should even like machines should be taxed. So if you, you look at now, they look quite ridiculous, but back then it was a real serious concern. Same that now we're concerned about these new models, but it will just become part of life and we, our time will be reserved for much more complex topics. But it would just push human, the humankind to another level. Excellent, thank you. I think that's a, a really great place to finish today's webinar. Um, I'm sure that our audience and myself could, could stay here all day listening to you speak. It's such a fascinating topic and you provided some wonderful insights for us today. Um, I hope that we can do it again soon and have you back on um, for another webinar in this series. That would be fantastic. I'm sure our audience would appreciate that as well. Um, Santiago, Christopher, uh, Christoph, if you have any closing comments, uh, or any takeaways for the audience before we finish, um, please do share them now. Just play with the tool, have fun, and integrate into your day-to-day -day jobs. You will see that your efficiency is greatly impacted and that you, you will be able to reserve your time for the things that do matter. Excellent, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Santiago. Thank you to our audience for being with us today. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Dan, and the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.